The point I was to try and do in this presentation is, is, I think, rather different from the two presentations you've had so far, because this is material which most people in this room are going to be very familiar with, don't need it spelled out in the same way as, for example, the, the, the data of Simon presented, which will be brand new to, to almost everyone in, in this room. So what instead I was to try to do is, is set up um, the situation for some points for discussion as much as anything else. And it's also very different from, from Lindsay's presentation, because if you think of Lindsay's presentation as being about whether we should think outside the box slightly in terms of the way we structure homicide, I'm thinking very much within the box here. If, if we have the current boxes, which we may not want to do, of murder and culpable homicide, how is it that we mark out the scope of the box marked murder uh, for these purposes? And as Lindsay explained, we, we do that currently through mens rea, we, we do not do that with reference to other factors. So again, everyone will be, will be familiar with something which actually is, is, is quite unusual, that we have a bipartite structure of mens rea. There are two alternative ways to satisfy the mens rea requirement for murder in contrast to, to most other crimes where there would be a, a unified definition. There have been suggestions in the past that actually there might in Scotland be a third form of mens rea for murder that actually intend to do serious or grievous bodily harm might be sufficient, but that has, I think, long since disappeared, so likely that that isn't the case. Some of the kind of examples that Lindsay referred to, killing in the course of it, crimes such as robbery, killing in the course of rape, killing by using lethal weapons, we know all be regarded as factors that are relevant to the question of whether wicked recklessness has been established, but we not be regarded as in themselves freestanding definitions of, of the mainstream of murder. What is, of course, interesting here, and which we've already touched on in the course of, of discussions, is the use of wickedness. It's what looks, at first glance, like some kind of overarching concept. So, although the, the crime can be committed intentionally or recklessly, in both cases, that must be wicked, and, and that's what the court tried to do, or the Lord Dodge tried to do in the case of jury, just as the recklessness must be wicked, so must the intention be wicked. But there are questions as to whether wickedness is really, in the light of subsequent cases, operating as a unified concept here, or whether in fact it's doing something different potentially in respect of, of each form of mens rea. Now, because we we do have an unusual, if not um, comparatively unusual, just what other, other jurisdictions say, but an unusual structure in terms of defining the mens rea about the, having the, these two alternative forms. Reform of the law of murder in multiple jurisdictions has tended to be concentrated by identifying something as paradigmatically a case of murder, and then perhaps identifying other cases which may not be the same, but which are morally equivalent to that. So if you look, for example, at the work that the Law Commission did in England, starting off when looking at first degree murder, with the idea of intentional killing as the paradigmatic case, but accepting after consultation that there were other kinds of very serious killing, which although not intentional killing, should be regarded as equivalent to that, and therefore properly categorised as murder. And that has, over time, always been, always been affected or bounded by the question of what is the sentence attaching to murder. So Lindsay has mentioned earlier the, the issue of the life sentence as uh, limiting what can be done here, which of course may be something that, that can be sized up to a certain extent if you start to talk about degrees of murder rather than simply having one unified category of murder. Historically, if you look at law reform efforts, they're of course very um, much characterised by the existence of, of the death penalty, which is why, going further back, particularly for the way in which American jurisdictions supported the, the English definition, often a great degree of, of emphasis in some reform efforts on premeditation, but not because that is uh, necessarily how you ought to define murder, but because that was thought it might be how you ought to define the cases that should result in the application of, of the death penalty. And here we're looking at a rather different question because we have two important factors, not just the life sentence. There's a very important question about the label to be attached, and when it's right to attach the label of murder. But nevertheless, a, a different question. And the question of the equation, because we haven't had a reform effort uh, through uh, legislation on the Scottish Law Commission in Scotland, when this stuff has come through, through the courts, and so there's an interesting switch or shift in the way that which makes this understood over time, as exemplified by the way in which this case of Scott looks at the court from the second edition of Joe Gordon's criminal law. Wicked recklessness is recklessness so gross that it indicates a state of mind as wicked and depraved as a state of mind of a deliberate killer. And know that wickedness in that uh, definition 
is doing something very clearly different from what it might be doing in the context of murder. It's about the degree of excess. It's about how bad this level of excess is. And it's so bad that the state of mind is as wicked into play as the state of mind of the deliberate killer. What the Court of Scotland does, in response to an argument by counsel that the jury should be directed on this basis, that they have to make a moral judgment about equivalence here, is say, well, actually, it's not that at all. It's something slightly different. It's a state of mind which falls to be treated as a form of deeming. It's a state of mind which is equated to that of the deliberate killer. Uh, but it's not a situation where the, ju the jury are drawing that moral equivalence. So that may be one that's being drawn by, the, in, in this case, some hypothetical lawmaker in choosing to align these two categories. Now, looking at this in relation to each branches of the definition and to highlight some of the issues that, that arise here, our first branch is wicked intent, but that has only been the branch for a, the first branch for a relatively short period of time. Because prior to the case of Drury, the standard withdrawal definition referred to an intention to kill or wicked directness. And what made the directness equivalent to intention was that it was wicked. That's at least one interpretation of that definition. Uh, Lord Roger uses a wicked in Drury as a way of not looking at degrees of intention in any sense, but as a way of explaining defences. Defences operate because they mean that you may have an intention to kill, but that intention is no longer wicked. The person who acts in self-defence may intend to kill, but not wickedly. The person who kills under provocation may intend to kill, they may do so in a way that should merit criminal penalty, but it's not wicked, and therefore they're guilty of culpable homicide rather than murder. Subsequent to jury, the courts have clarified, particularly in the case called uh, Oshersky, that actually what Wicked is doing here is very much a technical role. It's not evaluative, it is simply a, a question of is a recognised defence made out or not. If a recognised defence is made out or that there's the reasonable doubt required, then the intention is not wicked, then the person can be convicted most of culpable homicide or acquitted entirely. But it's not a freestanding power on the part of the finder of fact to decide that this was an intention to kill, but morally it didn't reach the level of, um, of wickedness. The second part of the definition, intention, is not something that has uh, seemingly caused the Scottish courts particular difficulties to date in the way that it has been a significant issue in England and elsewhere over what amounts to intention. If somebody foresees something as virtually certain, is, is, is that a form of intention or a basis for a finding of, of intention? We have simply not had the difficulty, and the explanation we always gave for that is, well, you don't need to rely on intention in Scots law, because you've always got the tenter of wicked rexes. So the, the hypotheticals that English law, well not hypotheticals, the real case as well, but the hypothetical that English lawyers would get very excited about, if you put a bomb in a plane because you want to blow up a valuable painting and claim an insurance money, do you intend for the passengers on the plane to die when that happens? Scottish lawyers could, could, could reply, first of all, that's not going to happen, but also, more seriously, uh, that would be wicked next, so we don't need to worry about the, the definition of, of intention. However, because Purcell now makes it clear in wicked next that intent comes into play there as well, it's not clear that that's something we can rely on avoiding indefinitely. So on the second limb, wicked excess, a number of issues that arise here. First of all, what work is the word wicked doing here? And here I think it's clear it's not a unifying concept. Wickedness here is not doing the same sort of work uh, or at least not only the same sort of work that Lord Roger referred to as doing in the case of intention in Drury. Okay, it, it may again something that's negated by defence, but that's not its only role here. Instead, <coughs> it's referring to a particular type of act, and that, of course, is important to differentiate murder from at least one form of culpable homicide. But uh, the, the way that we would explain to students, not necessarily the way that would be understood by, by a jury, is wickedness as a technical shorthand for three requirements that the accused intended to injure the victim, uh, acted in a manner that might have resulted in death, and did not care whether the victim lived or died. Now that's reflected in the standard uh, jury instruction in the jury manual. Wickedness was involves committing an attack of such severity that it could easily have led to death and be completely indifferent as to whether that might result as part of a longer gloss of what that means. That is unlikely, I suspect, to mean that a jury is going to. Uh, use the term in the same way as we would give to students, where we almost suggest that there's three separate questions that you, that you go through one by one. But of course, we have limited information about how juries might use this term, and we're reliant either on the emphasis we mentioned before, that how they react when the direction is given, or 
the law question in England suggests that, well, we can draw certain inferences from the fact that we don't ask questions very often, but there are very limited inferences that we, we can draw from that. Very quickly, the, the hypothetical problem that Purcell seemed to give rise to the fact that you don't need a, you, you do now need an intention value uh, if you're applying a test of wicked Brexit, became an issue in this case of Petto. Now, Petto was a case where somebody had set fire uh, to a flat to dispose of a body. Uh, the fire then spread, and a person living in the flat uh, upstairs was, um, was killed. They pled guilty to the murder, but later appealed seeking to withdraw their guilty plea. Now previously we might have said, well if you set fire to a flat and tin building, that looks like the next. That's, that's pretty clearly an example of, of murder. But because Purcell had made it clear that actually you need intent to injure, and that's why the really incredibly reckless, careless driver is not guilty of murder, because they lack that intention. The court of Petal had to try and explain, uh, well either had to quash the, uh, allow the Petal to withdraw the guilty plea, or explain why it was that this kind of death also equated to murder. And all the judges were agreed that it was murder, but had rather different views as to how that came about. So for, for Lord Gill, the answer was, well, fire raising is a, a, a willful act. Now, that's true, fire raising is a willful act, but that's not the requirement that the court laid down in, in Purcell. That doesn't get you to that conclusion. For Lord Carlyway, fire raising is an assault, which is an interesting characterization of something. But perhaps you could charge Pyrrhus as assault. We, we've never needed to think about that question. But again, that's not the requirement the court laid down in Purcell. The court said the intention to injure uh, was required. And that makes a difference because there are historically um, homicide cases where, for example, shooting at someone to scare them, it has been at least um, told to a jury in directions, but actually fatally injuring them because you hit them is culpable homicide and not murder because the intent to injure is not present, even though that's clearly an assault. The one judge that did, I think, uh, have a suggestion that worked was Lord Easy, who said, well, you can get there by saying you uh, are presumed to intend the natural probable consequences of your act. So in fact, Petto had intention on that basis. But there are whole, all sorts of other problems with that uh, kind of presumption, which has been particularly controversial a long time ago uh, in, in England. So I think there is a particular question, if, if we were to stick with a test such as Wicked Brexit, of whether intent to injure is the right sort of, uh, of starting point here for trying to categorise the cases that should be equated to intentional killing. And it, it may be too narrow uh, in uh, being defined in that way. The broader question, which I'm really going to just throw out as a way of ending the presentation, uh, is of course what is the viability of life, which is a, a term clear that others have used. All this is about identifying where it is that we draw the line between murder and, and, and culpable homicide. We can look at the current definitions and make the, not quite really technical objection, I think the issues that I raised are slightly, slightly broader with that, but that of course assumes that we are starting from the right point and looking at intention with correctness as the, the basis for differentiating murder from uh, other forms of culpable homicide. Now, this thing goes back to the broader structural questions. It may simply be a, a question of drawing the line differently. It may be a question of drawing lines in different places, of having more categories, of using the kind of grid system that Lindsay referred to. That, I mean, it's leads us into broader questions of, of how it is that duties are, are directed. If, if you start as giving a duty a grid, uh, you, you probably have to start directing it in a different way. And for example, uh, using written uh, direction routes to verity, which I think again the law commission regarded as important in terms of justifying a, a tripartite structure um, as, as being one that might be difficult to convey simply in oral directions. But I'm not going to try to answer that question, I'm going to stop here and throw things out for discussion. Thank you.